we did last time I had given some example values for these uh, heats of formation made a mistake uh, there, there is not supposed to be a decimal place that is supposed to be a comma that means you are off by about 3 orders magnitude in what we said as last time um, okay. So I want I was we were talking about this equation that is used to find the adiabatic flame temperature and the point I was trying to make there is if you want to have a fairly high uh, adiabatic flame temperature uh, for the for the products which which is given by having this ni double prime over here then um, what is given to us is ni single prime and t1 and maybe the pressure that is given to us which will determine ni double prime in a way that we will see okay. Um, but effectively what is happening is uh, if you now have a t1 let us suppose that is significantly low could be 298 Kelvin or uh, maybe 500 Kelvin or 700 Kelvin but it is not supposed to be it is not expected normally to be something like the adiabatic flame temperature itself. So effectively the sensible enthalpy of the fuel is going to be low because the temperature is the initial temperature is low okay. If you want to now have a, a high value for this that means you want to have a high sensible enthalpy for the products that means we want to have a high negative value of the heats of formation standard heats of formation for the products okay. So those are the ones that actually give you stable products you get stable products mainly when the products are having high negative heats of formation yeah and then this total will be such that you get a fairly high sensible enthalpy for the products and therefore the adiabatic flame temperature but if the total itself has to be high then given that the sensible enthalpy of the reactants is low and let us say that one of the reactants is oxygen which is like a reference element therefore the heat of heat of formation standard heat of formation for that is 0 we are looking for this total to be high only by looking at the heat of formation the standard heat of formation of the fuel okay that means we want to have the standard heat of formation of the fuel to be high okay or in other words you look for a substance which has a high standard heat of formation then you can identify that as a fuel that is the way we basically look at it right. So if you look at typical values of the heats of formation standard heats of formation for uh, 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 typical fuels let us say I have listed here taking the, taking uh, uh, the source from S. R. Turns book um, so let us say we have methane, acetylene, uh, ethene and um, uh, ethane and propene and propane right so you can keep on going uh, to higher and higher hydrocarbons. We see that some of them are negative some of them are positive okay but what we are looking for is essentially that even if they are negative they should not be high negative values okay. So it could be somewhere around 0 negative or positive positive is better but we do not want them to be as high negative values as the, the product standard heats of formation so that we will get some high temperatures there okay. So this is how you are essentially looking for identifying the fuel this is one point that I wanted to make. The second point I wanted to make um, today is by actually looking at it this way we are constructing a hypothetical set of reactions that do not exist in reality but it is actually somewhat in our minds for a thermodynamic convenience because thermodynamics uh, we, are, we are dealing with enthalpies here we recognize that these heats are all enthalpies and these are state variables right. So it is sufficient for us to actually go from one state to the other okay. So the way we are do you doing this in decomposing the enthalpy of the reactants into the um, standard heat of formation and the sensible enthalpy and we are also decomposing the enthalpy of the products into their standard heats of formation and their sensible enthalpies that is what we have done right. So what is essentially going on is you are starting with a set of reactants which are at some temperature and pressure okay. So by virtue of being at some temperature they are having a certain sensible enthalpy which is non-zero okay. By looking at this kind of thing what we are doing is we are now bringing the reactants from their 
given initial temperature to the standard condition by which let us say we now take away some heat okay and, and cool this and uh, uh, we, we now bring it to the standard state. So we now supply the heat of formation the standard heat of formation to these reactants at the standard condition all right and go through reverse formation reactions to make the reactants unwrap their bonds and give rise to reference elements. So you now have reference elements at standard state okay and you now have the reaction go happen that is you now have reference elements these reference elements now regroup themselves to form the products at standard state that thereby releasing the standard heat of formation for the products okay and finally we still have in this budget okay we still have some heat that is that is available to us which will which will be used to raise the sensible enthalpy of the products from the standard state to wherever it can go uh, so that you can you have heat used up all the heat that is available okay so the most of the heat was actually available to us uh, 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 in this process when you now try to actually form the products you got a lot of heat okay that heat has to simply and then you have supplied some heat to actually unwrap the bonds of the reactants to the standard uh, uh, standard state so you have to you have negate that okay you got some heat by getting the reactants from their initial temperature down to uh, the, the standard condition let us suppose that the reactants were heated up to 500 K okay there is already some sensible enthalpy available with them which was been which, which, which could be taken into account when trying to bring them down hypothetically to the standard condition right keep that heat with you supply some heat for unwrapping the bonds to get the reference elements and then get the reference elements to form the products you get a lot of heat over here little bit of heat over here you have supplied some heat over there all that stuff now will, will add up to some net heat that is available to you which you now dump on the products to raise the temperature all the way to the adiabatic flame temperature whichever temperature they can go to okay. So it is like a circuitous path it, thermodynamically speaking that we are taking for the reactants from their state to their standard state and then you form the, stand, the, the reference elements from the uh, reactants. Uh, and use the reference elements to form the products and then raise the temperature of the products to the to, to whatever okay. So this is the, the circuitous path that we are having in our minds while we are doing this okay. Sir, yes. They all are fused so why are there heat of formation some of have negative value and some have. This, this has got to do with the way the bonds are in there okay so you have like some of them are saturated bonds some of them are unsaturated and so on. So that is something that we won't get into in this uh, in this class. Okay, this this is like the, the, there is a thin thin line that is separating us from chemistry itself. Okay, so we don't we, we won't get into that. But the point I'm trying to make is the numbers. Okay, the the, the these are not supposed to be as high negative values. Okay, so it's okay if they are negative values, but they shouldn't be very high negative values. Okay, and if they are zero or positive, better. Okay, as high as possible that is algebraically high is what we are looking for okay and uh, the other point I wanted to make is so in, in, in all these things we have actually said there is like a adiabatic process that is going on that means you are not simply getting any heat at all right does it make sense when I burn stuff I get heat huh? <laughs> what are we talking about adiabatic. So it is not as if I am trying to say that this is an ideal thing and in reality there is some heat loss so it is not adiabatic and all that stuff no in reality you are not very far away from the situation for most applications okay in the core of the combustion process in, in let us say in a, in, a, in a rocket engine or a uh, gas turbine engine or whatever it is you get temperatures that are pretty close to the adiabatic flame temperature within let us say 100 degrees or something all right which, which, is, which is not a lot of deviation when you are looking at something like 2500 right. So we, we are not talking about a heat loss as a non adiabatic situation the point we are trying to look for is 
most of the time when you are looking at the heat that is generated in the combustion right we are primarily looking at the hot products that could be used the heat in the the, the high temperature of the hot products that could be used okay so when you are now looking at something like a um, steam turbine where you are actually essentially having a high, uh, high temperature steam that turns turns the wheels right you are you are counting on the high temperature of the steam to uh, the, the thermal energy that is associated with the high temperature of the steam to be imported into the turbine blades. Similarly uh, for the um, hot combustion products by virtue of the fact that they have high temperature is what we are trying to utilize so if you, if you just put, put a kettle on, on a stove okay what is actually heating the kettle is the hot products it is not the chemical reactions itself the chemical reactions are over uh, many millimeters below below, below the uh, kettle okay the flame itself is not really near the kettle at all okay the flame is if, if the flame were to happen near the kettle the flame will get quenched and it will become non adiabatic but the flame is actually on the stove okay on the, on the burner and you, you get these hot products and the hot products are the ones that are actually flowing around the kettle and heating up the uh, kettle right. So the question basically then is what is the heat that you are going to get out of a chemical reaction or in other words in you know looking at these fuels with heats of formation and so on maybe in uh, lots of practical applications as well as in your high school or wherever you have learnt any combustion you would have come across things like heating value of the fuel okay or a calorific value of the fuel and so on. So when I now have a fuel in hand can I can you tell me how much it is going to how much heat it is going to give okay do not tell me all these things like the circuitous route over which it is going through and then heats of formation transaction reference elements and all these things that is that's too, too confusing okay is it, is it possible for me to see the calorific value or the heating value of the fuel from this can we can we you can it is all embedded in here right so what we are looking for is if you now did not really bother too much just just for the sake of approximate uh, argument okay if you did not bother about the fact that the the reactants and the products had different CPs the molecular weights and so on right. So you are just simply looking at sensible enthalpies you are simply saying I had a bunch of reactants at a let us say room temperature or initial temperature T1 okay and so that means the sensible enthalpy of that was pretty low and I had to now get have this fuel release heat that will increase the sensible enthalpy of the of what were reactants to start with to a very high sensible enthalpy value for the products okay. So the heating of the, the heating value of the fuel is primarily going into changing the sensible enthalpy of what were reactants to what was what, what, what will be products. So essentially that is that is what is going on so if you now look at then this part minus this part that is the sensible enthalpy change that is being effected okay if you now take that to one side okay and keep this part and this part to the other side then it becomes automatically that the difference in the standard heats of formation weighted by the individual stoichiometric coefficients of the products and the reactants is effectively the heating value okay or in other words the heat that is actually released due to chemical reactions in the combustion primarily comes from a difference of the heats of formation weighted by the amounts by which they are this is this is basically what is going on okay and it comes directly from here okay. So finally the last point that I want to make here is this essentially says that all of combustion is all about a, a transaction between heats of formation and sensible enthalpy. We started out with substances the reactants which were low in sensible enthalpy high in heat of formation okay. We now finally get to products which are high in sensible enthalpy and low in uh, heat of formation. So essentially it is like what you started out with low sensible enthalpy high heat of formation gets transformed into the other combination okay this is exactly what is going on in a in, in determining this adiabatic flame temperature okay. So now let us look at the question that I posed towards the end of last class 
which is where is the pressure showing up here right it's supposed to be a constant pressure process where is the pressure showing up here is really the question right. So the answer to that is sitting in this Ni double prime or the pressure is possibly the one that is going to dictate what should be the composition of the products is, is what we expect okay. The question is how okay. So the next point that we have to look at is composition products. We will start with a very simple example which is going to be puzzling to us in a minute right. So example let us suppose that we consider a reaction where you have CH4 plus O2 gives uh, CO2 plus H2O okay. Can we figure out first of all how many species are there in this system 4 species the capital N here is 4 right. How many well I should not ask the next question now so can we now figure out uh, let us suppose that we had 1 mole of uh, methane uh, okay and then we will we'll, we'll do what is called as balancing the re reaction right. So we now have 1 carbon atom here 1 carbon atom here that is fine and then we have like 4 hydrogen atoms here we have only 2 so we get 2 moles of um, water there and then uh, we have like uh, 2, uh, 2 oxygen atoms here and then 2 there we have only 2 so we, we have this. This is supposed to be a stoichiometric reaction yeah so this is what we this is what we expect. Now here it is pretty clear the composition of the products is just as clear as the composition of the reactants okay this is this is the stoichiometric stoichiometric right. So uh, so CH4 plus O2 will be uh, fuel uh, fuel rich because uh, we are we are we are starving the system of one one mole of oxygen and uh, CH4 uh, plus let us say uh, 3 O2 is fuel lean right and correspondingly we should now be able to put in let us suppose that some excess excess in the case of fuel rich we, we now suspect that there must be some excess amount of methane that is remaining as, as products and in the case of fuel lean there is like some excess amount of oxygen that is remaining the products we should be able to find out yeah. So for example we now have CH4 plus 3 O2 whereas 1 mole of CH4 is going to consume only 2 moles of oxygen there will be 1 mole that is excess okay and if there is 1 mole that is excess what is going to happen to the adiabatic flame temperature why why would the adiabatic flame temperature decrease if you now had a excess amount of reactant that is off stoichiometric condition the answer is you are now actually soaking up so much amount of sensible enthalpy for the excess reactant that is remaining for it to be also taken to the adiabatic flame temperature. You see therefore you are not going to reach a very high adiabatic flame temperature it is sort of like you now have this excess reactant that is remaining there which wants to share the pi on what is available for the sensible enthalpy rise okay so you are not going to rise, rise a lot whereas if you did not have any excess okay it is only the these products the, 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 the uh, stoichiometric products that are, that are remaining then they, they are the only ones that are going to actually go high up in the in the, in the, in the sensible enthalpy therefore they can actually reach fairly high temperature. So what it means basically is near the stoichiometric condition I am not saying at okay and, and, and let me qualify that a little bit near the stoichiometric condition is where we can expect to have the highest adiabatic flame temperature okay off stoichiometric conditions the, the adiabatic flame temperature drops because you are having excess of one of those reactants that also needs to be heated up to the 
adiabatic flame temperature therefore you do not get up to that high in adiabatic flame temperature as you would without the excess reactant right okay. So why near instead of at it is got to do with how you look at the sensible enthalpy recall that we could look at the sensible enthalpy as an integral CPDT or if you are thinking calorifically perfect gas which is which is simpler it is like simply CP times T adiabatic minus uh, T, T difference right. So it now matters on what is the CP of your reactant okay. So typically you will have and, and the CP will depend on the molecular weight okay and typically we expect that the fuels will have lighter molecular weight when compared to oxidizer and therefore a higher CP and so if it can actually hold more heat it is going to decrease the temperature because the CP is now holding the uh, heat and not allowing for the temperature to rise okay. So that is going to send so if you are now looking at how the uh, adiabatic flame temperature is going to vary as a function of uh, fuel R ratio okay you are going to actually have a peak that is slightly away from the stoichiometric uh, value because the CPs of uh, fuel and oxidizer or, or, and the reactants they, they, they will be different so you have, you have to work that out okay. The other thing that you can also think about is in this reaction we are only looking at O2 but in reality it could be air which means you have a lot of nitrogen involved right. So you now have nitrogen which does not participate in the reactions that means it shows up on either side of this reaction okay what is the consequence of the presence of nitrogen for the adiabatic flame temperature relative to if you did not have the nitrogen obviously you are going to have much less adiabatic flame temperature because the nitrogen is now sitting there soaking up the heat okay so it is now going to contribute to the sensible enthalpy component as well. So when you now have a total amount of sensible enthalpy that is available for you to increase the temperature the nitrogen also comes in for its share therefore you do not get a very high, temp, high, high um, uh, sensible enthalpy. Keep in mind the nitrogen has a CP which corresponds to a diatomic molecule okay. So instead of nitrogen if you had let us say organ all right which is a monatomic molecule its CP is different because CP typically depends for gases particularly on the, um, the atomicity of the molecule okay monatomic, diatomic, polyatomic and so on okay when it is polyatomic whether it is linear or is it non-linear and so on right. So it depends on whether you have rotational degrees of freedom that needs to be considered and all those things right. So if you now replace the nitrogen by organ then you, can, you will now find that the way the diluent so effectively nitrogen as well as organ was acting like a diluent and the diluent is now going to the, 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 the um, monoatomic nature or the diatomic nature of the diluent is going to change the way that the adiabatic flame temperature comes down and even within a monoatomic if you now try to replace organ by helium yeah so organ has a higher molecular weight helium has a lower molecular weight correspondingly the CP changes right. So uh, uh, on, on a per unit mass basis and then the, if, you, if you now calculate things on a per unit mass basis then you will again see differences. So I would like you to work out those kinds of details like for example in, in, in an exam we can directly ask you uh, if, I, if I now replace so much amount of nitrogen by so much amount of organ what is going to happen to the adiabatic flame temperature increase or decrease okay so you should be able to figure that out okay. So those are things that we can look at. What we were talking about is the composition of the products and as I was pointing out if you have a stoichiometric mixture where you have considered these two as the stable products finally you now know exactly what the composition is. If you are now looking at off stoichiometric situation you could still expect one of the reactants to be in excess and find out what it is or how much it is excess right in which case you still know what the composition of the final products are including the excess reactant that was on the product side okay. So where is the problem? We could find out the composition of the uh, products we know what the Ni double prime is the pressure does not come into picture at all is there a problem or 
or does does not the adiabatic frame temperature does not, not depend on the pressure at all right because we you might expect because it is based in enthalpies and for ideal gases we showed that enthalpy is only a function of temperature it is just a balance of enthalpies okay constant pressure yeah we are balancing enthalpies therefore constant pressure otherwise it does not matter. So pressure does not come into picture at all that is not quite true okay in reality you know now we have to look at reality okay in reality these are not the only products that happen these are the products that we would like to keep okay these are the products that we would we would be expecting as the stable products but imagine when you now have these so the these as the final stable products and keep in mind that these are the final stable products that means they have the highest negative heats of formation which is now going to give rise to an estimate of a very high um, adiabatic flame temperature that is to say if in case they were the only ones to exist you are now going to have a high enough adiabatic flame temperature that is now beginning that is now going to cause a decomposition of these right they just cannot exist at those temperatures the way they are okay. So H2O could now get in get decomposed into OH and H for example right and that decomposition is going to soak up some energy and decrease the adiabatic flame temperature that is one, one problem as far as the T adiabatic is concerned but the other big problem that we are talking about is how much H how much OH if I now have to factor in that you need to have some H and OH also thrown in there okay how much H and how much OH because I need to know that otherwise I would not know first of all it increases the number of species right total number of species the second thing is what is the Ni double prime for those and if you are now going to bring in those this is going to change so pretty much everything changes right so how do we bring the existence of those kinds of um, uh, ions or radicals in there okay as, as, as decomposition products of the stable, um, stable products what we then assume next okay is that let us suppose that you started out with reactants and they Give, so that you could go through this fictitious path and all that stuff that, that we talked about you are now looking at the final state the final state of adiabatic flame temperature is such that these products are in equilibrium with their um, dissociation products okay. So if you now have H2O okay it could be in equilibrium with OH and H right so if CO2 were to decompose it could be in equilibrium with its decomposition products again we do not know exactly what would be the nature of those decomposition reactions right there could be multiple ways by which these decomposition reactions could happen. So the simplest way again is for us to hypothetically assume formation equilibria that means if you now look at many more species of these unstable many more unstable species to be considered right we now have to actually consider their formation reactions as the um, uh, equilibrium, reac uh, equilibrium reactions okay. So let us just go through that a little bit more so in reality uh, reality uh, we just do not have only the most stable products but uh, many unstable products of dissociation right as well. So uh, in general
we could assume say uh, say for uh, for the H2O2 reaction right H2O2 reaction if you now say H2 plus half O2 we have strictly strictly speaking if I were to look at only this table most stable um, uh, product here sure it has to be H2O okay. So what I would actually have to say is I have only and, and I would like to say it is only one mole so that means I know A is equal to 1 yeah but in reality we have to now consider BOH plus CO2 plus DH2 plus EO plus FH all right. Now what happens here is because this is stoichiometric okay we were not expecting either O2 or H2 okay if it were off stoichiometric let us say if it is fuel lean right you could expect some O2 if it is fuel rich we could expect some H2 that is what we were thinking before but now what is happening is you could have H2O decompose into OH and H but H could combine to form H2 okay and you could also have O atoms come up okay during this decomposition which can recombine to form O2. So you now have a, a soup ball of lots of things that we did not really bargain for all right and all these things are there. So how do you handle them okay so effectively we now need to have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 unknowns that we need to work out okay. So previously how many unknowns did we actually work out by balancing the reactions we worked out about 2 or 3 okay 2 here if one of them were excess we would just be able to handle that as well. How did we do that how did we actually end up finding out the, the composition of the products by what is called as balancing okay what were we doing when we were balancing we were actually looking at the counting of the number of atoms of a particular type okay so what, what did I do I said I have one carbon atom here I have one carbon atom here through four carbon hydrogen atoms here but only two therefore I put a two there and so on right. So I was essentially looking at a particular atom type and I was balancing the number of atoms this is the hallmark of chemical reactions because chemical reactions are all about exchanges only at the electron level and not at the nuclei level okay and what you are looking for is a mass balance in a chemical reaction mass is conserved it is the nuclei mass that we are looking at okay. So we are actually mentally writing what is called as atom conservation equations for each atom okay and you can only write as many atom conservation equations as the number of atom types that are there in the system okay. So in the case of so to, to, to give you an example so in the, in the case of CH4 plus O2 how many atom types are there 3 okay we have carbon hydrogen oxygen so you, we know we can call this a C, C hyphen H hyphen O system okay CHO system okay. In the case of the H2O2 system how many atom types are there only two okay so if you now were to write atom conservation equations for these okay in, in an attempt to balance the, the reaction we would we would get two re, uh, two equations but we still are actually having six unknowns that means there are four more unknowns for which we need to develop equations right. So let us first do what we can which is atom conservation. atom conservation equations which is um, on the left hand side for uh, for H atoms we can write 2 that is given to us okay um, so 2 is equal to we have 2A plus B plus 2D plus F basically looking at wherever hydrogen shows up okay and for O atoms we have 1 equal to A plus B plus 
2 c plus e okay. I want to note here that uh, we could have also considered um, O3 ozone yeah uh, H2O2 and there is this notorious uh, unstable species called HO2 okay but they are too unstable okay. If we were to consider them that means we will have 9 species okay and then we are still stuck with only 2 atom conservation equations that, that means we now have to develop 7 more equations right and what we expect to find is these will be in very trace quantities that means if you now had uh, after H if you had G H and I for these these G H and I values will be very small is what we are expecting okay there, there, therefore we are, we are neglecting this. So what is happening now is the final answer for the adiabatic flame temperature actually depends on how many products you are willing to consider. If you were to consider only two products, you will have a fairly high estimate of the T adiabatic. Okay, if you want to have realistic estimates, that means you have to consider more products. How many more depends on how cumbersome you want to get yourself into. Right, so we want to be reasonable. That means we we neglect some uh, most unstable species, but we have to consider some less unstable species also in the picture. Okay, so and then we have to now look at equations for these. So what did I say? We now consider hypothetical formation equilibria uh, for the other ones, right? So effectively, what basically happens is you now look at OH, O, and H, for example, and H2O. Okay, these are ones that are not reference elements. H2 and O2 are reference elements. So in your mind. You should be essentially look looking at these two equations actually serving the cost of O2 and H2 which are the reference elements for the two atoms atom types that we are looking at that means for every reference element that is there as part of the products okay it corresponds to a certain atom and the, the atom conservation equation for it is essentially tagged to its coefficient is, is like mental note. It's all all of them are coupled together. It's like it's difficult for you to say this equation belongs to that and so on. But for for us to number or uh, what do you call uh, uh, enumerate the number of equations that we have, effectively any product that is not a reference element is what we will be writing the hypothetical formation equilibria based on the reference elements. Okay, so then you will get the additional equations. So that's what we are going to do now, which is um, equilibrium. Formation equilibria reactions, right? So we now say H2 plus half O2 gives and takes H2O, half O2 gives and takes O, half H2 gives and takes uh, H and half O2 plus half H2 gives and takes OH. So obviously when you write formation equilibria for H2 and O2 it will simply be H2 gives and takes H2 so that's 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 no news okay you know or that's no news and therefore there is no use okay. So here there is some use to actually considering hypothetical formation equilibria for non reference element products. Okay, that's exactly what we are trying to do here. So, with this, what, what can we write? Okay, we are, we are assuming equilibria. Therefore, we can write equilibrium reactions, equilibrium equations. Okay, so this means for these, we can write. We, we can write KPF at T adiabatic. We don't know what is T adiabatic. But we suppose that at, at this adiabatic flame temperature is where the equilibrium is existing between um, the, 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 the hydrogen, oxygen and water 
uh, oxygen and its atomic form, hydrogen and its atomic form, and oxygen, hydrogen, and OH. Right. So we have to write these at T adiabatic, and then try to find out what it is. So pH two O divided by pH two PO two to the half KP uh, KPF T adiabatic. Um, um, we have to have the subscript here uh, for let us say O uh, then is this P O divided by P O 2 to the half K P H K P F H T adiabatic equals P H divided by P H 2 to the half and uh, KP KPF H2 um, H oh, I'm sorry OH equal to uh, POH divided by PO2 to the half PH2 to the half right. Now we did not bargain for the pressure to come in the partial pressure these are partial pressures right we did not bargain for the partial pressures to come in there. So we wanted to now we want to now change these partial pressures to the actual pressure the total, the total pressure when I say total pressure it is not like the stagnation pressure in gas dynamics this is the total sum of all the partial pressures okay this is the thermodynamic pressure okay. So now we are beginning to talk about the effective pressure you see the pressure at which this equilib this this the entire reaction from the reactants onto the products is happening is basically going to influence the proportion of the um, stable products versus the unstable ones okay. So dependent upon the pressure and dependent upon the, the KP equations the proportions of these are going to get altered okay therefore the pressure is going to influence the, the, the existence and the amount of the unstable reactants that will soak up some heat and alter the adiabatic flame temperature of the products you see that is how the pressure is essentially coming into picture. So uh, um, here we can write uh, PK equals XK times P where XK equal to NK double prime divided by um, N where N equal to sigma um, sigma over all K NK double prime that means you add up all the number of moles of all the products together which we do not know yet okay this is what we are trying to find out we are trying to find out the NK double prime yeah but whatever it is it is going to have a total and the total will be n and then if you now take the value of n the, the kth species double prime divided by the total you get xk and xk times p so the p is the pressure at which the reaction is happening right this is a, this is a pressure at which the reaction is happening then we are beginning to get the p in the picture and uh, therefore uh, you can now plug this in here and all these things see effectively you are now going to get well uh, in our case or for example if you now assign the uh, uh, numbers for k going from 1 to n let us suppose that 1 is uh, 1 corresponds to hydrogen uh, 2 corresponds to oxygen 3 corresponds to uh, water and so on then a would be n 3 double prime okay. So in this in this thing we would now plug in n3 double prime n4 double prime and so on okay. So effectively everything is going to be in terms of um, some n, n, uh, n k double prime all these things you can now rearrange them okay. So how do you do this so uh, in general in general uh, we could have 
any stoichiometry right um, given by given by let us say half n h h 2 plus half n o o 2 gives we now have to write n h 2 o h 2 o plus n h 2 h 2 plus n o 2 o 2 plus n h h plus n o o plus n o h o h okay. So I'm, I just do not want to use a b c etc anymore because I might just cross 26 okay there is that so many alphabet so many letters of the English alphabet. So I will just keep n subscript whatever it is and uh, then we get um, 2 n h 2 o plus n o h plus 2 n h 2 plus n h equals capital N O capital N O essentially refers to the number of oxygen atoms in the entire system okay we took a half N O because we have a oxygen molecule okay um, and uh, N H 2 O plus N O H plus 2 N O 2 plus N O equals N H which is the I am sorry I made a mistake this is N H over there and N O over, over here these are the atom conservation equations okay um, N equals N H 2 O plus N H 2 plus N O 2 plus N uh, H plus N O plus N O H okay and uh, um, K P K P let us say K P 1 equal to N O divided by N O 2 to the half P divided by N to the half you now plug in these uh, mole fraction information okay in terms of pressure and N so strictly speaking we actually we can get rid of this and then say this is H 2 O and uh, uh, no 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 I am sorry this is this is this is K P O uh, or specifically we should say K P F O this is K P F um, H equal to N H divided by N H 2 to the half P divided by N to the half and uh, K P O H K P F O H equal to um, N O H divided by N O 2 to the half N H 2 to the half and uh, the P gets cancelled here. So we do, we do, it does not show up and then K P F H 2 O equal to uh, N H 2 O divided by N O 2 to the half N H 2 and here pressure shows up with a negative exponent minus half all right from this we will we will now do this rewriting uh, in the next class so effectively what we want to do is write each of these n o n h n o h and n h 2 o in terms of n o n o 2 n h 2 because the denominators are all in terms of n o 2 and n h 2 okay and then we can plug that back in here and you will now get two equations and two unknowns okay on in n h 2 and n o 2 okay but those equations are going to look very ugly and then you have to solve that uh, iteratively and then get the compositions once you get the composition we can go back and solve for the adiabatic flame temperature using this equation okay. So we will continue from here uh, tomorrow.